located in Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We know that you will be blessed. To learn more about the House of God, visit us online at www.houseofgod.org. Be blessed.
thank God today for the blessing of being able to share with you today, each of you that are sharing with us today. We do give honor and praise and reverence to the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is good. He is good all the time. And we celebrate him today. So thankful that God has blessed us to be yet in the land of the living uh, with all the unrest and COVID-19 and all the hardship that uh, the world is experiencing today. I just thank God for his favor that he's allowed us to assemble here one more time. We do give honor to all the saints and members of the house of God, those that are watching around the, the U.S., those that are watching internationally. Uh, we thank God for your presence here today. And any visitors that we have, anyone sharing on this a video today uh, that's not a member of the house of God. We want you to know that you're welcome and God loves you and we love you too. And thank you for taking the time to watch today. Uh, we're excited uh, as we shared with you and been sharing with you for the last several weeks. We are celebrating the feast of the Lord. You say, well, what are the feast of the Lord? There are those times that God has ordained in his word uh, to celebrate either a memorial to some great act or event uh, in, the, in, in the history of his relationship uh, with mankind or some prophetic uh, event that we're looking forward to. But whatever the case is, we're just thankful today that God has blessed us to be celebrating the Lord's feast days. They are real, they are relevant, and they are part of the plan of salvation uh, that God has instituted for mankind to observe. So we're celebrating the feast of the seventh month. You say, well, what is the seventh month? On your Roman calendar or your Gentile calendar, you may find designations for uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, or Rosh Hashanah, or Feast of Trumpets, and the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, or better known probably on your calendar as Sukkot. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I encourage you to take a little time and investigate the feast days, the feast of the Lord. Uh, today we want to continue. Last week we talked to you about this closing feast, uh, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, or as I said, identified on your calendar, it may be identified as Sukkot. Uh, that references Booth, uh, temporary dwelling place, uh, the word Sukkot really means uh, booth and that. But we're celebrating that because God ordained it as one of his festivals. It is an observance of seven days with an eighth closing day uh, identified in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, we're not going to read that. We read that earlier, but it the institution or foundational scriptures for these feasts give you all the particulars of the feast. They are referenced, many of them, in the New Testament. Uh, the difference with the New Testament reference is that it does not give you the directive in terms of the holy days or what time or, or what the, the uh, do's and don'ts are of the day. It doesn't give you the month, it doesn't give you the date, it doesn't give you the time. So you cannot use the New Testament as a reference in terms of when or what time uh, God wants his feast days observed. You must go to the foundational scriptures uh, that are found in the books of, of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers where God does give you the dates and times for his holy feast days. Uh, these are feast of the seventh month. You say, well, what is the seventh month? Seventh month is the uh, feast uh, month in the Bible uh, where the closing feasts are identified. The feast actually started in the first month in the spring of the year uh, with Passover and, and the uh, Pentecost and those. But the closing month feasts are in the seventh month. And they are uh, the... Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and uh, the Feast of Engathering or Sukkot. So we are in the closing uh, feast month and the closing feast of that seventh 
month. We're excited about it. God gives some very special uh, directives on the observance of this feast uh, in Leviticus and, and Numbers and those books. One of the things that he says for us to do is to rejoice. And I talked about that last Sabbath day, to rejoice. It is a time of celebration. Uh, most of God's feast days take place around the agricultural seasons uh, identified uh, in the Bible in the spring and also uh, in the uh, latter spring and in the fall. This is a fall feast celebration. It took place in Israel's time. It took place when they were gathering in their crops in the final harvest of the agricultural year when they had gathered in their crops and surveying uh, the blessings that God had, had suffered them to experience and the bounty of their harvest. It is also a time of reflection. Not only do you reflect on the goodness of God and the blessings of God, but you reflect on uh, God's relationship uh, with you and with I. And in Israel's case, his relationship with them, uh, going back to their very early existence, going back uh, to their times when they were slaves or bondsmen uh, in Egypt. And God delivered them, delivered them out of Egypt and brought them uh, into uh, across the Red Sea and brought them into the Sinai Desert. What an experience they had there, place that they've never been before, place of hardship, place of unknown. But God provided for them food, clothing, shelter, everything that they needed, uh, God provided for them. And it was a long journey. Uh, some 40 years uh, they had the experience of being sojourners, if you will, uh, in a land that they knew not. And God made a way for them through that time. Uh, this is where the concept of the Feast of Tabernacles really comes from, or the Feast of Booths. Sometimes it's referenced as a Feast of Booths or Feast of in Gathering, or uh, in some cases people call it the Harvest. But the Bible calls it, uh, in Leviticus, the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Tabernacle part really comes from the fact that they had temporary dwelling places or tabernacles that were shelters to, to keep them uh, safe. Uh, because they did not have uh, sufficient materials. Uh, sometimes they were constantly on the move. Uh, they were not able to build permanent uh, dwelling places, so they had these temporary dwelling places. But God provided for them. So he wanted them to remember that, to remember that during this Feast of Tabernacles. He gave a directive to them, along with the one to observe it for seven days, uh, with the eight-day closing celebration, but he gave, he gave directed to them that all of them that were Israelite-born or to dwell in booths uh, for reflection and remembering that he sustained them, kept them during those 40 years in the wilderness. So during this season, they actually built temporary dwelling places uh, made of the... Uh, what wood they could find and coverings from uh, palm trees and branches and that to put coverings on them and they actually uh, dwelt in those. That was part of the requirement. Uh, that, that has a lot to do with the name Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths. Uh, Sukkot really means booth or dwelling place. So it was a Feast of Booths, if you will, that God uh, caused them to uh, utilize during this time. And many of them today, many uh, Israelites uh, during this time will uh, build temporary shelters or temporary uh, edifices uh, commemorating uh, what God had done for them during the 40-year uh, period uh, that they were in the wilderness. Rejoicing is a big part of this feast, a big part of it. We should always celebrate God for what he's done, for what he's doing. Uh, I never was an Israelite born. I've been adopted into the, the, the family of Israel based on 
what Jesus Christ did, but I am not a natural born native uh, part of Israel. So for that reason, I don't usually build a booth. Uh, some uh, do. Uh, I don't condemn you for that, but I will say we must certainly uh, give God thanks for what he's done for us. What he did for Israel is a part of their testimony. What he's done for you, what he's doing for you, is a part of your testimony. So it is doing these seven days, doing these seven days, uh, that we should reflect and give thanks to God for his goodness and his mercy. The feast also have, they have a future application. They have a future or prophetic uh, meaning. And that, that comes much into play in our observance of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, it is during this closing month feast where all of God's feast days have been, uh, you've had the experience of all of them, starting with Passover in the spring and closing out with the Feast of Tabernacles. These are God's holy feast days. Now, I, I'm going to make a point here because I have many, many friends uh, that are part of the house of God. I have those of diverse religious beliefs, uh, Christian beliefs, and, and that, uh, that have not come to the understanding of the Lord's holy feast days. And many of them feel like the, the feast days aren't relevant. Uh, they are for the Jews, uh, they are for Israel, they are for the Hebrews, and they're not for Christians. That is not an accurate assessment. Jesus Christ observed the feast days. He observed the feast days, not because he was a Jew. And, and our country, our religious beliefs, certainly for those uh, Christian Judaic uh, beliefs, were divided along the lines of Christians and Jews, Christians and Jews. Christians observe uh, certain times, Jews observe certain other times. Jews observe Passover, Christians observe Easter. Uh, Jews observe uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Christians observe Christmas. And, and we're divided along those lines. And, and these are beautiful celebrations. Uh, Christmas is a very beautiful celebration, a uh, very uh, uh, devout kind of time of year that people remember the birth of Christ and do all the celebrations connected with it. The same thing with Easter, but it's divided uh, along lines or whether or not uh, you are a Jewish tradition person or you are a Christian. That is not biblical. That is not biblical. That is not biblical. A lot of the traditions that are part of uh, religious beliefs today have really come from man establishing uh, religious holidays and religious uh, beliefs and, and traditions. Uh, if you follow the Bible or you read the Bible, and you, you will find that the only days you find there that God has ordained for us to observe are what he calls his feast days. His feast days. Feast of the Lord. When you read the institution or when you read the foundational scriptures, they always identify the feast of the Lord. Not feast of the Jews, not feast of any group, but feast of the Lord. And, and that becomes a real critical issue in terms of, of, of celebrating them. Jesus did not observe the Feast of Tabernacles because of Jewish tradition. He observed the Feast of Tabernacles because it was one of the Feast of the Lord. I know when you read in John chapter 7, uh, it will talk about Feast of the Jews. And that's simply because the Jews were the people that were observing it, but it was not their feast. It was a feast of the Lord. And that was a big distinction, a big distinction uh, in that, that sometimes people don't, they just, they don't reference it. 
they don't uh, see that these are not Jewish feasts, these are the Lord's feast. And not only are they the Lord's feast, but the Lord incorporates in these feasts, and I want you to pay attention to that. I'm not going to read the scriptures, we read them each time. But I want you to pay attention to the fact that God establishes holy days in these feasts. Man cannot declare a day holy. Only God can declare a day holy. There are holy days, holy convocation days, no work days, no survival work days associated with the feast of the Lord. And only God can do that. As great as some of our our religious denominations are, and there are many great ones with, with great traditions and, and, and great history, but they do not have the power or the authority to, to ordain a day holy. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. And this, this sets the, the Lord's feast days apart from some of the religious traditions that, that are so dear uh, to, to mankind and, and so beautiful and, and so uh, sacred in nature, but you won't find them identified in the Bible. You will find the Lord's feast days there. I want to I share a perspective with you today that maybe uh, you haven't thought about. As we rejoice and we go through these, these holy feast days of the Lord, most of the Christian world, most of the Christian world, when I say Christian world, I mean those are your major uh, Christ-focused uh, uh, denominations and, and beliefs. Most of them, most of them will recognize that there is something uh, that's going to happen uh, when Christ returns, uh, when he sets up his kingdom on this earth. And it, it has to do with the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ as referenced in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20 and, and uh, even chapter 21 uh, uh, after the thousand-year reign. Most, most Bible-believing uh, denominations, certainly those that believe in Jesus Christ, will acknowledge, will acknowledge that yes, there's going to be a thousand year reign of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, when he returns. It will commence his reign, setting up his kingdom on this earth. You'll find uh, reference in, in the teachings of Jesus Christ, you will find him referencing his kingdom his kingdom, his kingdom is not of this world. Remember at the end of his ministry, uh, preparing for crucifixion, uh, he identified that, that his kingdom was not of this world. Uh, he's going to establish his kingdom on this earth. And most biblical scholars and most commentaries and most of those that, that study the Bible uh, refer to that period as the millennial reign. The millennial reign. Isaiah talks about it. Uh, Zechariah uh, talks about it. Uh, uh, other biblical writers talk about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And remember, that takes place after the Lord's return. Now, we get excited. We get excited about his return because we, we understand that as his, when he returns that there will be a resurrection of those that are his. And we look, all of us look forward to that. And upon that resurrection of the dead and, and also the translation or the change of those that are alive who will receive the glorified bodies, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and, and other places it's talked about as well. We get excited about that. But the, the, the point that we, we, we fail to see sometimes is 
that the Lord is going to establish on this earth, on this physical earth, he is going to establish an order uh, of his kingdom. And as a part of that, uh, there are going to be things that will be a part of it. And, and I know that all of us love our religious traditions, we love our customs and practices and that, and uh, we love all the celebrations that, that we have, but God's going to establish during that millennial reign the order of religious celebrations. And, and what will be a part of that is going to be his holy feast days. His holy feast days. And they're not going to be celebrations for Christians and celebrations for Jews. There's not going to be uh, celebrations for Gentiles, celebrations for Israel. There's going to be one celebration uh, that, uh, or, or that, that will be structured and ordered by the Lord. It's just something to think about. If you've not been introduced to the Lord's feast days, I encourage you to do some independent research. Do some independent research in the Bible. And, and look at these because they're worth taking in consideration because if you are going to be a part of a millennial reign when Christ comes back, you will be observing the Lord's feast days. You say, well, I've come from other traditions. You may come from other traditions and that's fine. Many of us have come from other traditions. But when the Lord returns, when he returns, the only days that he's going to be teaching and promoting are his holy feast days. So for every believer, this is why you hear often, often hear me say, every believer, if, if you, you need to consider the Lord's feast days because that's what you're going to be observing. I know you may have different traditions now and you may be very, very dedicated to those traditions because most of us are dedicated to our religious beliefs, and customs, and practices. But during this time of looking at the Lord's feast days, and especially the feast of the closing seventh month, they all point to a time when our Lord shall return. And we're all looking forward to that. Those of you that, that believe and, and understand, or have some understanding, of the millennial period. I want to read some scriptures for you. You will have to do your research and your homework on these yourself. I'm going to pick probably the most common one. The most common one. And, and keep in mind that this was written before the birth of Christ. Before the birth of Christ. And in Zechariah, Zechariah uh, speaks to some very uh, Pointed things in Zechariah 14. We, we always go to the millennial reign. But Zechariah dovetails some things here that Christ talked about in Matthew chapter 24. And, and the subject today is, is just the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Simple subject, the Feast of Tabernacles. But Zechariah talks about some things that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, and I talked about them some the other week, um, about the things that are going to come, the things that are going to happen. He talks about the wars, he talks about the rumors of war. This is what Jesus talks about. The rumors of war and the pestilence and the famine and all those things that he talks about. And he talks about, you know, all, all the religious uh, prophets, if you will. Not all of them were his prophets. Some were false prophets. He talks about that. He talks about the prognosticators that will be talking about his return and when he will return and all those things that happen. He talks about the, the earthquakes and all those things that happen. He talks about the inhumanity of mankind uh, to each other. He talks about that talks about the, the, the love of many waxing cold, talks about all of that, talks about 
the wars that will happen, the wars that will happen, the nations, the great nations uh, that, will, that will inflict pain upon all of humanity, talks about that. Talks about a turbulent time. Uh, a time so turbulent that he says, you know, if, if, if he doesn't come back and, and shorten those days, now think about that, that there'll be no flesh saved. So he talks about that. And then he talks about some things that are part of his judgment on this world. Things that will happen in the heavens, things that will happen with the sun, things that will happen with the stars, things that will happen in the cosmos. These are not, these are not man-inflicted things. These are God-judgmental things. So Christ talks about a whole range of things to come. But interestingly enough, and I encourage you to read Zechariah for yourself, but Zechariah talks about a time that is classified as a day of the Lord. A time like the world has never seen before. He talks about Jerusalem. And he talks about Jerusalem be surrounded by enemy nations that fight against it. It's not a pretty picture. Not a pretty picture at all. Uh, he, he opens with that uh, in Zechariah 14. And, and he says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, verse, verse uh, 1, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Now listen to this. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken. Houses shall be rifled. The women ravaged. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth, fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. So these are things to come. And, and before that millennial reign comes, there will be violence the world's never seen before. And there will be judgment from God as the world has never seen before. Tribulation. People talk about the tribulation. Tribulation will come. And there will be violence, war, and all those things. But Zechariah says some other things that are, that, that are very hopeful. He says in verse 6, And it shall come to pass in that day uh, that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. So he talks about these are things that will happen under God's authority leading up to the return of the Lord and that millennial reign. But listen to what he says in verse 9. I'm skipping through. He says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Pay attention to that. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, and 
His name is one. Now listen, I'm, I'm skipping down to verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. That is extraordinary. Because some of those nations that will come up against Israel, very well may be pagan nations, very well may be nations of other religious faiths, other religious traditions, one that does not observe the feast, one that don't observe the feast of the Lord. But he says this, all of those that are left, now let me explain what that indicates. Some of them will be destroyed. Some of them will be devastated because Jesus says, except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. We're talking about an awful time. And we're talking about wars like the world has never seen before. And we're talking about the judgment of God that is also a product of all of this. That's why Zechariah says, and it shall come to pass that every... every everyone that is left of the nations that came against Israel shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Why? Because there's going to be one Lord, one king, one ruler, and that's Jesus Christ. So regardless to what the traditions are among those nations, what their religious traditions and customs might be, they will come up to observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Listen to what he says in verse 17. And it shall be that whosoever shall not come up, now I want you to listen to this verse carefully. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of the families of the earth. Listen to that verse. And it shall be that whosoever shall not come up from the families of the earth unto Jerusalem, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Well, what families, what families of the earth? That doesn't say families of the Middle East. It says families of the earth. And then in verse 16, it says all of the nations, nations, nations. I want you to, I want you to understand something here. There's a lot about this that, that I don't understand. There's a lot about this that, that, that no preacher understands. There's a lot about this that no theologian understands. These things are going to happen under the authority of God. I don't understand the millennial reign. No, and, and there's been more written on the millennial reign. You've got the pre-tribulation folks, the post-tribulation folks, all of these theories. We've got all of this out there. What I know, when I look at this, it talks about a time when God will reign on this earth in the presence of Jesus Christ. Listen to verse 18. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not that have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen. I, I get, listen to this. Listen, listen to this verse. 
This is extraordinary. Verse 18, and if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that cometh not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. Why? Why is that? Why is that? Because that's the feast of the Lord. If you believe in the millennial reign, if you believe in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, if you're looking forward to the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, you must spend time looking at the Lord's feast days. You, you got to do it because that's what's going to be in the millennial reign. Not only Feast of Tabernacles, all of God's feast days. Zechariah points out the Feast of Tabernacles. But I'm saying to you, the feasts of the Lord are relevant for all of mankind. They are not limited for the Jewish people. They're for all mankind. Read it for yourself. If the nations of the earth fail to come up for the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, God has, a, God has a, a, a way to get their attention. He says, no rain. Listen to this, verse 19. This shall be the punishment of, of Egypt. Egypt has different religious traditions. You know that from, from, from your religious studies. You know that. If they don't come up, the punishment of all nations. Let me read this verse again. Verse 19. This shall be the punishment of, is, of Egypt and, and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, that's in your Bible and it's in my Bible. I don't have a special Bible. This is the King James Version. It's in yours. If you've never read it, you need to read it. If you're not considering the feast days, you need to consider them because it's going to be a part of that great experience that all of us are looking for when the Lord returns. He's not going to, to, to promote man-made religious holidays. He's not going to do it. He's not going to promote the traditions that, that many of us, many churches, many denominations, we use the term faith today, many faiths. It's going to be one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's Jesus Christ. So when I look at the feast days, I'm encouraging, if you're not familiar with them, spend some time. They're not, they're not, they're not man instituted. They're God instituted. And he is going to promote them when he comes back. You say, well, what, what about Christians? If you are a Christian, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm using the term Christian loosely, I'm taking a very simple definition that most folks use. Christian is generally identified as a follower of Jesus Christ or Christ-like. If you classify yourself as a Christian, then the Lord's holy feast days are for you. Christ observed them and he will be the head of, of the feast days. So the Feast of Tabernacles, this, this closing feast of God's uh, biblical year, this closing feast looks to a time that's identified, that starts, that starts with the resurrection of the dead, the translation of the saints, as described by the Apostle Paul. He's the one that probably has done more in, in giving us glorious descriptions 
of the resurrection, when the dead in Christ rise and all of that, and, 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 and when we take on that immortal body and no, you know, no more corruptible flesh and no more dying and no more pain and no more suffering and, and all of that that we love as, as believers, we get excited about that. As Christians, folks get excited about that. If you believe that, you need to look into the feast days. Because with that glorified body, you're going to observe Feast of Tabernacles. You're going to observe it. You're going to observe it. Uh, and, 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 and Christ is going to be the one that's leading. If you look at this, it says all nations. The United States does not have a lock on Things that pertain to God. We are a Christian nation. Yes, we are. By our own definition. Not by God's definition. By our definition. We define ourselves as believers in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have accepted the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, if you have accepted salvation through Jesus Christ, he is not going to lead you to millennial and have you observe holy days that are not his. He's not going to do it. That's why this verse in Zechariah, and I think most Christian believers look at the prophetic word of Jesus Christ. And I hear many, many preachers preaching about the millennial reign. The piece that they leave out in many cases is the fact that all nations, including the U.S. And I want to say uh, emphatically clear that salvation not instituted in the U.S. Out of all of our grand churches and of our grand preachers and all of that, the God of the Bible did not institute salvation here. And many of our customs and traditions are not biblical. They just aren't. They're beautiful. But many of them are man-made. Or, or, they come from traditions that are not biblical traditions. What Christ is going to do in a millennial reign is bring us back into alignment with his holy feast days. He's going to bring us into alignment with Sabbath observance. That's what he's going to do. He's going to take us back where we recognize the seventh day, the Holy Sabbath, that goes back to creation. It's not Pentecostal. It's not holiness. It's not any denomination. It is that holy, sanctified, set-apart day that God did back in creation, and Jesus never changed it. So, as you look forward to the millennial that this feast points us to, we just as well start researching and spending time and studying God's word to find out what's it going to be like? What, what days are we going to observe? Zechariah gives us one of the clearest pictures here in the Bible. And what he says is sobering because he says, you know, all the nations of the world, every nation, every nation, including this one, every nation. And you say, well, how's this going to affect? How, how's this going to, how's, this, how's Jesus going to do this? I'll tell you one key, and I read it the other week. In Revelation chapter 20, what's going to make this a little bit easier? 
He's going to take the devil out of the picture. He's going to bind it a thousand years. That's significant. That is huge. Because you won't have the devil now running around saying, Oh, this whole day, and this isn't it, this isn't it. He's going to be bound. Jesus is going to teach and preach Feast of Tabernacles uninterrupted by Satan himself. The other thing that's going to happen, many of those nations that have been opposed to him, those nations will be defeated. And they will see the hand of the Lord working openly in the earth. It's going to change some thoughts. It's going to change some minds. So I encourage you, if you're not familiar with the Feast of Tabernacles, spend some time. Use objective material. Use objective material. What does that mean? Material that's not slanted. The Bible speaks for itself. Read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. And when you read it for yourself, pray to God before you read. And ask God to open your understanding. Ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you through the Word. It's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge many of your beliefs. It'll challenge many of your, tra your traditions. It will challenge many of the things that you've done for years and years. It will challenge you. Yes, it will. And it will make you think. Jesus chastised the Jews. And he chastised them for teaching doctrine or teaching for commandments the traditions of men this is why many of the traditions in Judaism they're beautiful they're wonderful they have no foundation in the scriptures they're traditions they're, they're customs and traditions without biblical and I mean Bible support So, just about every religious group has its traditions that they hold dearly, but they may not be biblically based. They may be beautiful, they may have a lot of, 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 of uh, sacred sounding, looking things in them. But what you're looking for, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? So spend some time looking at the Feast of Tabernacles, I think. Uh, you will be enlightened. And I'll say again, every believer in Jesus Christ must be striving to be a feast observer. A feast observer. And what has given these feast days such a bad rap, I'll give it to you clearly. People look in the Old Testament, they see all the bullocks, rams, lambs, burnt offerings, sin offerings, sacrifice offerings and all of those and they associate that of something that they should not do well let me tell you Jesus Christ replaced every one of those sacrifices every one of those offerings every one of those animals and he shed his blood for remission of sin he shed his blood that you and I might have an opportunity to be saved. That's why the, the, the Bible says, you know, those offerings had no ability to save people. The blood of Christ did. Too much bloodshed for you and me to ignore the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. And closing on this, all of these holy feast days connect to Jesus Christ. Every one of them connects to Jesus Christ. The, the, the one that opened the door for all the others connects to Jesus Christ, and that's Passover. The Bible says even Christ, our Passover. It's not a Jewish Passover. It's the sacrifice of Christ becoming the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for humanity. Each one of these feast days points to Jesus Christ. Without 
him they don't have power. Christ brings them alive. So God bless each of you today. I hope that I did enough to cause somebody just to go back and take a look. Dust off your Bible and really see what it says about the Lord's feast days. Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you today for all things. I thank you for your mercy, your grace, your kindness. Thank you for the uh, knowledge of your holy feast days. For all of those listening today, God, I ask you to touch their thoughts. Uh, cause them to consider uh, your feast days and see uh, the relevance of them uh, for today's believer. I thank you, God, for all things. And I ask your presence upon all of those that are listening, watching here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Now the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless each and every one of you.